All right. Here we go. Simone, if you would like to begin your presentation by sharing your screen. I shall do. How is that? Perfect. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. All righty. And I'm just going to figure out a couple of things here. Right. Lovely. Um, and along with um, with Vets for Climate Action, I'd like to acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people as the traditional owners of the lands on which I'm living and learning and working today. And I pay my respects to Elders past and present and extend that respect to any First Nations people who are present today. I wanted to start by telling you a bit about Wildlife Health Australia because that's uh, fairly central to what we're going to talk about today about climate action in terms of wildlife. Um, so Wildlife Health Australia is the coordinating body for wildlife health in Australia and our principal objectives are the protection and enhancement of the natural environment. We work through networks of government and non-government stakeholders to link and inform and support those concerned with wildlife health. And we contribute wildlife knowledge and information to disease prevention and preparedness and response. I guess one of the central tenets of uh, Wildlife Health Australia and the way we go about our business is the concept of One Health. And I wanted to touch on that first because, in my view, it's also fundamental to how we go about taking action on climate change in the context of disease. So uh, for those of you that this is old hat too, if you could just uh, listen patiently and uh, we'll get everybody else up to speed. Um, the One Health paradigm recognises that all health, whether you're talking about ecosystems or animals or humans, is codependent. So if you look at any one aspect, you're only going to get part of the picture like our six blindfolded friends here encountering an elephant and all coming to a different wrong conclusion about what there is actually in front of them. And many of the diseases that impact humans and livestock actually originate from wildlife. So adopting an, a One Health perspective expands our understanding of the problem, but also our opportunities for solutions. And I believe the same is true for climate change impacts. Um, another aspect of this that's important is that, generally speaking, environmental health is the often forgotten uh, part of the triad of One Health. And I, th I think for that reason, it's important for us to keep reiterating the One Health paradigm in our discussions of climate change impacts. So Wildlife Health Australia is a non-government agency, but our major funding has always come from government. Originally, the basis of our funding was our contribution to the safeguarding of biosecurity through wildlife surveillance. But in 2022, we received Commonwealth funding over four years to develop a One Health program with the aim of protecting native wildlife and also enhancing our national capacity to prevent, detect and respond to emerging disease threats. And as a result of that funding, our, our agency has exploded a little bit and we've got a lot more people. Uh, including myself, and we now have these four main programs of uh, activity in addition to a bit of expansion in our communications, marketing and business support. So what exactly do we bring to the table as Wildlife Health Australia? Well, I think our greatest strength is our ability to engage a large and diverse group of stakeholders who have information and expertise that's relevant to wildlife health issues and who can better contribute that expertise to the resolution of issues because of their association with Wildlife Health Australia. The core of our approach is the active management and expansion of those relationship networks. Um, in Australia, that's uh, a fairly well-established process in many areas, and it includes um, networks with jurisdictional representation from environment and biosecurity agencies in all states and territories, a lot of Commonwealth government network connections, including in um, public health and in the environment sector. So we're, again, looking at that One Health um, coverage a number of national wildlife health state stakeholders uh, who will be familiar to you if you're working in wildlife, including the Australian Registry of Wildlife Health and the Zoo Aquarium Association. 
We have a number of surveillance partners outside of our um, state and territory biosecurity and environment agencies through um, zoos, sentinel clinics and universities as well. So if you're looking for a holistic perspective on a wildlife health question, we're in a good position to put you in touch with the right people and to broker productive relationships. Uh, our network works could always be better and our capacity building program is working on establishing stronger links with Indigenous groups, with rehabilitators, with uh, feral animal industry and also the research sector. We also have an international One Health team now, which was established last year and that works across the Asia, Asia Pacific as a World Organization for Animal Health Collaborating Centre on Wildlife Health Risk Management. So our Collaborating Centre team aims to use that One Health lens to integrate wildlife health into um, health efforts in the Indo-Pacific region to lead to successful health promotion through the region. Wildlife Health Australia also maintains the National Wildlife Health Database, which is known as EWIS, and that receives data from a network of surveillance partners across Australia. Those data are used for addressing our national reporting obligations and also for identifying trends and improving our knowledge of wildlife disease syndromes. Another important part of our remit is providing wildlife health information that's evidence-based and current and authoritative. We have over 150 fact sheets available on our website and they provide information on particular diseases or disease syndromes in the context of Australian wildlife and One Health. Um, we also have an incident information pages for incidents of importance. Um, the one you can see here is our uh, high pathogenicity avian influenza incident information page, which has been getting a workout for the last year or so. Um, we also also provide a regular electronic digest to our subscribers, which summarises wildlife disease related news occurring in Australia and internationally. An important part of uh, the way we go about a, a One Health objective is ensuring that the wildlife health perspective is understood and visible in health and disease issues of importance to other sectors. So, for example, during the recent Japanese encephalitis outbreak, we convened a national meeting with ecologists and wild bird experts to harness their expertise to inform surveillance and response activities. Uh, I mentioned high avian influenza a moment ago, and that's a big focus of, for us at the moment because it's having huge impacts on wildlife globally, but hasn't yet made it to Australia. And so we're providing wildlife expertise and advice uh, through our government networks to improve our national high path avian influenza planning and preparedness. We supported over 90 wildlife disease investigations in 2023. So that means that at least once or twice a week, we're hearing reports of wildlife disease incidents through our network. And we progress those by connecting stakeholders, providing expertise and contributing insights from previous related events um, that might've occurred in the past. We also provide um, some funding to support some of those wildlife disease investigations. Wildlife Health Australia also has a reputation as a trusted and neutral party with skills for facilitating interdisciplinary discussion and collaboration. Um, in 2022, we were part of a team that coordinated input from over 50 stakeholders and subject matter experts to develop the National Koala Disease Risk Analysis, um, which was a, a big effort and a great example of bringing people together from across the nation with different perspectives to come to a, a common um, understanding of the place of disease for koala health. Um, on the global scale, we contribute to international documents, particularly through the World Organization for Animal Health. Um, so recently we helped to draft the, this guidance document on considerations for emergency vaccination of wild birds against high path avian influenza. We're also increasingly engaging in the development of tools to assist in decision-making and risk management for wildlife disease. Um, one recent example here is a wildlife disease decision-making tool called Wildest, which was developed to assist government agencies in determining if uh, an investigation or disease management interventions are required for a wildlife health incident. So just to 
help them understand what they're looking at and and um, evaluate it in an objective way, even if they don't have um, wildlife health expertise themselves. It helps them to find that expertise and understand where the gaps in their knowledge are. Um, in the high path avian influenza space, we've developed a risk mitigation toolbox for wildlife managers, um, which uh, is gauged to help them develop their own prevention and preparedness um, documentation in advance of a uh, high path avian influenza outbreak. And I'll talk later about the climate change guidance tool that uh, we've got under development at the moment. So that's a very quick whiz through Wildlife Health Australia. And we'd love to have you visit our website to find out more and explore our resources. And you can also join our community email list for free, which gives you access to our regular electronic digest and other broadcast notifications relating to wildlife health. So that link is on the web bottom of the website homepage if you're looking for it. All right, enough about us. On to climate change. Um, the, the question of climate change as a One Health problem, um, I think, is important to consider. Uh, I think it's well recognised that climate change acts as what we call a threat multiplier that act, interacts both directly and indirectly with a whole bunch of um, other variables and pressures, particularly anthropogenic uh, pressures like uh, food production, food security, land management and so on. Uh, to my mind, climate change is the quintessential One Health problem because environmental temperature is such a fundamental driver of evolution and of a behaviour. And this is probably more obvious when we consider wildlife than in the more engineered environments of domestic animals and humans. And perhaps that's why it's front of mind, particularly when we're looking at wildlife who live and play and work and eat and drink and protect themselves entirely within the national nat natural environment. Um, wildlife practitioners are increasingly aware of that One Health link and they're incorporating this whole of ecosystem thinking into the way they consider disease. And I mentioned the koala disease risk analysis previously. And one of the big take home messages for um, that our stakeholders wanted us to get across in that DRA was that disease doesn't just happen. The disease is intimately linked with what's going on in the environment, with uh, communities, with uh, politics, with a whole range of other um, pressures. It doesn't just turn up out of the blue. So what our lovely group of stakeholders uh, contributed to creating is this amazing flowchart that we ended up calling the spider, um, which shows some of these interconnectivities and really illustrates that you can't you can't just tease disease out you can't just um, separate any one of those factors from from the other factors um, and you can see climate impacts and environmental disasters down here in the corner and I, I think this is a really good example of how climate change is is really embedded in all these other threats that uh, face animals and uh, by extension, all of those threats are also related to one another. And you could probably do a spider like this for, for most species in the wild and most um, threats that they face. And I think we really need to embrace this sort of complexity if we're going to incorporate climate change in the way we think about animal health and disease. So I'd like to just talk now about how climate change affects disease dynamics in wildlife. And yes, it's, it's complicated. Um, there are some overarching observations that I can make, and these aren't really peculiar to wildlife, but um, I think it's, it, it's worth uh, talking about them in the context of wildlife. The first is that climate change doesn't occur in a vacuum, as we've just uh, seen. You can't tease wildlife away from other animals, ecosystems and human health, and you can't tease climate change away from these other anthropogenic drivers such as urbanisation, land modification and food production. Secondly, organisms experience climate change at all scales because temperature drives such a massive range of these evolutionary and behavioural processes. Um, so from the global, where an animal is in the world geographically, to the microscopic, what's happening in its cells, climate change is going to have its impacts throughout that range and throughout that scale. Um, 
And incidentally, the study of microclimate is emerging as pretty vital to the epidemiological modelling of climate change impacts in wildlife. Um, and, and what that means is that we need to understand scale if we're going to have effective response strategies. And finally, there's a conspicuous lack of linearity about how climate change impacts. You don't get more climate change and then more problems necessarily. You, in many cases of certain disease systems and in terms of organism th fitness, they can tolerate and tolerate and tolerate and then suddenly reach a tipping point where a small change can bring about a sudden decline. So that puts us in a, 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 a really challenging space when you're trying to anticipate what's going to happen today or tomorrow or the day after. So how do we navigate all of these complexities? Um, perhaps you're thinking, well, wouldn't it be great if there was a textbook that could help us to navigate all this stuff? Well... I'm glad you asked because there kind of is now. Um, this book, Climate Change and Animal Health, um, hopefully some of you are aware of it. It was um, published last year and I highly recommend it to anyone interested in animal health, not just wildlife health in the context of a changing climate. Um, full disclosure, I co-authored one of the chapters with Bethany Jackson from Murdoch University um, and incidentally, our chapter does include a plug for Vets for Climate Action. So you're in, pub in publication through our chapter. Um, but the editors, Craig Stephen and Colleen Duncan, have really done an amazing job in not only exploring climate change and animal health from a range of perspectives, but also making the text very action focused. And so as well as chapters on the impact of climate change in the context of infectious disease and zoonosis and disasters and contaminants, there's also chapters on the mechanisms and determinants of climate change and disease and action-oriented chapters about leadership and economics and preparing for the unanticipated and, and hope for okay. health. So um, Wildlife Health Australia's approach to climate action draws heavily on this text and I'll be citing it extensively in this talk. So if you've read it cover to cover already, uh, you might be a little bit bored, but um, I've included the chapter references on the slides as we go through so you can see where I'm, I'm citing the text. And um, here's the uh, the link where you can have a bit of a closer look at what's in, what's in the text as well. So what I'd like to do now is just talk briefly about some examples of climate change impacts from wildlife in the context of some of these, these mechanisms and, and drivers for climate change um, that are, are most important in the wildlife space. So again, when you look at, at uh, again, thinking about scale, we, we can kind of separate out the impacts of climate change into where organisms are going and how organisms are faring. So where we find them is, is something that's uh, significantly driven by climate, but also how they're doing at the, at the physiological, the cellular, the um, tolerance level, the immunity level. So lots going on. Um, these diagrams, again, are from our chapter from the Climate Change and Animal Health book, and our chapter was on infectious disease, but a lot of these, th this way of, of dividing it up was fairly consistent across the chapters and um, is, is quite useful regardless of whether you're talking about infection or non-infection. So if we look at where organisms are going first, and um, I'll just highlight a few examples as we go through. Um, when you look at monarch butterflies, what has been found is that a milder climate reduces the need for monarch butterflies to migrate, and that leads to persistence of their protozoan parasites due to a loss of migratory coloring, culling of infectious, of infected hosts. So you end up with um, pathogen persistence, which you wouldn't have got if you, in, in the absence of climate change. In Nepal, we're seeing dengue fever emerging at higher elevations because of an expanded range of Aedes vectors, mosquito vectors. Conversely, in Ghana, we're seeing a decline in the persistence of malaria occurring at te because temperatures are starting to exceed the optimum for year-round vector transmission. So this is a good example of where 
um, disease expression can be either increased or reduced depending on what's happening at a particular local scale. And our last, ooh, there we go. Um, our last example here uh, involves um, caribou and muskox um, and a, a particular syndrome known as host switching. Uh, in this case, it's uh, related to the varistrongulus lungworm, which is um, a caribou parasite, but its survivability is increasing with warming temperatures. And so what's happening is as migratory caribou move into musk oxen areas, um, the lungworm are persisting in those areas because it's slightly warmer and suddenly we're getting exposure of musk oxen to these lungworms which they haven't previously been exposed to. So you get, you're seeing introduction to novel and naive hosts and that can have a range of impacts, um, express, expansion of endemic range of parasites and, and these opportunities for host switching. So if we look at the other side of the ledger and uh, how organisms are faring. One of the things that, uh, again, we see um, in terms of uh, animal tolerance is, is host switching in terms of what they call the dilution effect. So when you have an endemic species with an endemic parasite, but that species, um, uh, the numbers become diminished through um, habitat destruction or whatever, the parasites are forced to look elsewhere for, for effective hosts. And in North America, that's happening with um, Lyme disease. We're finding that deer numbers are being reduced through habitat loss. And so ticks are increasingly um, becoming attracted to humans because there are fewer deer around. And so human cases of Lyme disease are increasing as a result of those impacts on wildlife. Uh, a really dismaying example of this that happened um, a few years ago was um, with the mass mortality of Saiga antelope in Kazakhstan in 2015, where um, over 200,000 animals died in about three weeks. Uh, and it's thought that unusually high relative humidity and temperature had a triggering effect in this mass mortality event. Uh, it wasn't the heat that killed them, but that caused enough stress to trigger um, pastorella septicemia. So a whole bunch of, of these animals died from pastorellosis. And it's thought that high temperature and humidity were the trigger for that mortality event. Um, our friend, the muskox again, this time uh, talking about their own endemic lungworm, um, which has got a really excellent scientific name that I always forget. It's something like Uming Max Strongulus. In any case, um, the development cycle of this lungworm has halved from two years to one year. So there's an increased frequency of disease outbreaks due to uh, the warming climate and what that's done to the ability of that parasite to replicate. So once again, it's, it's not necessarily all bad news. Um, when you look at farmed salmon, um, we're seeing that uh, some of the bacterial infections that they're prone to, uh, one in particular caused by flavor bacterium called cold, wa cold water disease, we see um, less mortality um, when, uh, well, mortality is higher at lower water temperatures. And there's a, a feeling that, that the impact of that bacterium could actually be um, constrained by warming temperatures. So it's really important to kind of think all around uh, the possibilities when you're trying to work out um, which way climate change is going to impact uh, wildlife disease. And probably the mother and the father of um, climate change impacts is uh, is Hendra virus. It's really hard to go past it as an example. It's, it's absolutely the gift that keeps on giving in terms of potential climate change impacts. And that's because... Um, it's, it's a complex disease with a, a reservoir host, which is the bat, um, several spillover hosts, including uh, humans and um, horses famously, and also this very interesting pathogen, which has my full respect. It's incredible. But again, if we look at these um, two areas of where animals are and how they're faring, 
in the context of um, Hendra virus. With the reservoir host, we've got bats um, expanding southwards in Australia, seeking their food sources, which puts them into contact with new and potentially larger spillover host populations. So that increases the capacity for spillover. We're also seeing loss of migratory behaviour in bats because they're becoming increasingly dependent on urban food sources. So again, you've got bats batting up against urban land use and permanent camps in close proximity to horses. In terms of spillover hosts, again, that expansion into urban and peri-urban landscapes increases that likelihood of contact with bat colonies. And as the temperature goes up, horses are increasingly seeking shade and maybe spending more time under trees where bats are excreting Hendra virus. Uh, the pathogen itself, we're getting higher levels of viral shedding because there's this reduced connectivity between reservoir populations. So you don't get maintenance of Hendra virus immunity within bat populations. Um, and also host switching due to increased encounters with these spillover hosts. In terms of how animals are going, um, any of you who uh, have anything at all to do with bats will know that they are uh, under increasing nutritional and thermal stress with warming climates, and that's reducing their immunocompetence and leading to increased viral shedding. And also the food shortages they're experiencing cause them to behaviorally aggregate around scarce resources, and, and that has implications for contact and transmission of virus. Uh, likewise, there's increased frequency and intensity of encounters between horses and bats, and, and that implica by implication and by association, humans are um, brought into the high-risk bracket. And we talked briefly before about microclimate factors, including temperature and humidity and UV light and dust, and all of them can alter the environmental persistence and um, have limit, limitations on available pathways for spillover transmission for Hendra virus. Um, so this, this is an example that we talk about a lot in our chapter on animal health and climate change, because it's a, a really good local example of how uh, complex and interconnected the, um, the implications of climate change can be for an infectious uh, disease in wildlife. Right, so moving on a bit to some of the other um, uh, non-infectious causes of disease, um, algal blooms are um, increasing worldwide with the um, with warming waters, um, and they say that the, the that uh, about sixty eight percent of lakes have experienced more algae blooms blooms since satellite imagery started, while only eight percent have declined. Um, and we expect that that will be um, also seen in marine environments over time. Um, a number of algal toxins can cause uh, mass die-offs in a range of wildlife species. Perhaps one of the more famous is domoic acid, which has caused massive uh, die-offs in the past of sea otters in North America. Um, once again, we have this complex in interrelationship of climate change with other um, anthropogenic drivers. Obviously, nitrification of water bodies and land use also have their impacts on algal blooms. So we can't cleave climate change out on its own, but it's definitely uh, it's definitely going to be a threat multiplier for algal blooms. In terms of the movements of contaminants, this is another area where um, uh, wildlife can be very vulnerable to climate change. Um, the impact of climate change is going to be greatest in Arctic and Alpine habitats because warming in those areas is twice the global average. So if we take um, hexachlorocyclohexane, HCH, as an example, that's uh, HCH is an isomer of, an, of the insecticide lindane. Um, and what we, what we see in this figure, uh, uh, this is an example of how climate change can influence HCH in an Arctic food web. So this first panel shows you what happens in normal climate conditions. So you have lots of sea ice, HCH is stored, stored in the sea ice, seals and, and um, polar bears and fish use sea ice as habitat. So it's a place to hide, it's a place to hunt, it's a place to hang out. And so 
because they use it as habitat, they're feeding on ice-associated prey. Polar bears are feeding on ice-associated seals. So what happens with increasing ocean temperatures is that you get that earlier breakup of sea ice and the sea ice melts. And so HCH is released from sea ice into the sea water. But in addition to that, these um, sea ice habitats and refuges get a lot smaller. So um, the HCH is up, taken up by fish, which are now open swimming. They're not uh, associated with um, hanging around icebergs and so on. And so seals shift to open water associated prey because there's less ice for them to, um, to hunt near. So they're drawn into the open water where there's these HCH loaded fish and polar bears shift to open water associated seals. So you end up with this biomagnification effect where HCH increases in polar bears. Um, this example of HCH um, is was chosen by the, the chapter authors because it's well studied in this context, but they make the point that that same mechanism is often implicated for many, many different contaminants, uh, whether they be pesticides or microplastics or whatever. So that mechanism is fairly, is fairly consistent across a whole range of contaminants. Um, in terms of natural disasters, I guess this is uh, more our happy hunting ground in Australia and something that, that we've, we've become increasingly and devastatingly aware of in recent years. Um, and there's growing recognition that the plight of wildlife in disasters is very much a one health issue. Not only is it a window into what the ecosystem impacts are, but there's an increasing acknowledgement that humans have an obligation to consider wildlife impacts in emergency management and that the mental health of humans is often adversely impacted by reactive and unstructured responses to wildlife in distress. Um, and that was nowhere better exemplified than in the 2019-20 bushfires, which in which nearly 3 billion vertebrates were dis wild vertebrates were displaced or killed and serious gaps in the emergency management of wildlife were exposed in in subsequent inquiries So um, all this hopefully doesn't make you want to throw your hands in the air and give up um, let's talk now about how we turn what we know sort of into what we're doing actually and what the, what the key messages are. So there's all sorts of ways in, in which we can think about climate change action in relation to um, disease. Um, the Manual for of Climate Change and Animal Health has loads of useful information and one of the editors, Craig Stephen, has a real gift for simple graphics to capture actions. Um, I really like this diagram here, which he calls a continuum of success in combating climate change impacts. Um, but in preparing for this talk, I was particularly struck by um, the final chapter of the book um, that I wanted to share with you, which was um, Craig and Colleen, the editor's five um, points for or key messages for how we go about action in climate change. Um, and this is obviously not peculiar to, to wildlife, but it certainly um, resonated with me and what we're doing in the wildlife sp space. So firstly, yes, we can. Um, the emphasis here is on the word we, as in you and me and not someone else. Um, none of the contributors to this climate change in animal health book started their career as climate and health experts or advocates. All of us have just use the knowledge at our disposal to apply our expertise to influence a small part of the climate health equation. So systematically identifying your span of influence in which you can legitimately and effectively make a positive contribution, no matter how big or small, is, is what we should all doing be doing. Um, and at this stage in my career, I'm, I'm really troubled by imposter syndrome, but I do find myself falling into those thinking patterns sometimes when I'm talking about climate change. And I think this yes, we can message is a good reminder for all of us to push past those feelings and just, just get on with it and do the best we can. Um, secondly, we must work together. And that's uh, a central premise of uh, One Health and the interdisciplinary um, message that One Health brings. Uh, and the more we work together, the more we get accelerated responses to help break um, through the status quo to, to innovative ways of thinking. 
Thirdly, we can't wait for certainty. Um, there's been a, an increasing focus on um, rather than trying to strive for certainty to manage understanding and managing uncertainty. Um, and it it doesn't doesn't dictate that we wait until we know for sure, but it it it, it enables us to work in the face of uncertainty because we're, we're never going to get that. And um, so we need to kind of push past that and once again, do the best we can with the information that we have. Finally, fourthly, we can challenge the status quo. And the, the quote from, from this final chapter in the book is, if we keep on doing what we've been doing, we're going to keep on getting what we've been getting. Um, so we need to... Um, work through people's psychological defences against change and throw ideas out there. And um, they, the more that we can get people past this concern that they're, they're not acting in everybody's best interests and, and this paralysis of, of change, the, the more we're going to get good outcomes. And finally, um, it's about animal health, which seems like a, a truism, but I think it's 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 a really good reminder that whatever we do to keep animals, and in my case, wildlife healthy, is going to be keeping them fitter for resilience for climate impacts. So what you do every day with animal health is important, um, purely and simply from a resilience perspective and, and not uh, because climate change has these huge inter interconnected impacts with everything an animal does. So if we keep them healthy, we're, we're, we're solving the problem um, regardless of whether we're tackling it uh, straight on. So there's been a, a lot of conversation already in the wildlife sphere about uh, climate change and wildlife. And I thought I'd share with you um, a little bit of the conversation that occurred in the Wildlife Disease Association Australasia chapter conference last September, where we had a good conversation about how we were feeling about climate change and, and what we thought we could do. And it's just a nice little uh, example of what another association is doing and thinking in this space. So the things that gave our audience hope was... Um, there were many things and that was nice to see. People were very encouraged by the new generation of young people who understand and who care about um, climate change, the normalisation of little achievements um, about the way we go about sustainable work and sustainable lives, um, the feeling that our small choices as consumers are, are absolutely making a difference and that um, meeting with like-minded people helps to remind you of those things. And I think vets for climate action is, is very important in that context. Um, in terms of economics and legislation, that we're, we're reaching an economic, economic viable, viability tipping point in terms of fossil fuels and that helping us to, to push the climate agenda. And it's emerging, climate litigation is emerging as a factor in the risk decisions of corporates as well. And the technologies we need are already here. Um, we do have anxieties and worries. And I was introduced to the word solastalgia, which is the distress caused by the lived experience of negatively perceived environmental change. Um, we tried not to dwell on that and, and to talk about action again. Um, and the importance of linking our scientific investigations to climate change and providing an action to go with the information that we provide. And this is a common thing that researchers are looking at increasingly. And adding our voice to advocacy group, telling positive stories about wildlife, listening with respect to um, non-academic learning pathways and framing climate change in the wildlife health context. And as WDAA, that we can lever our understanding and our resources to um, improve uh, wildlife health professionals' um, understanding in other regions. We can call out misinformation and provide reliable and evidence-based alternatives. So again, all those things are not peculiar to wildlife, but they certainly um, give you a feeling for how the conversations are going in our sphere. So that brings us on to uh, the climate change impact guide. It's a tool that I uh, touched on previously. So just wanted to talk a little bit about what WHA is doing. Um, so we have uh, started developing this climate change impact guidance tool, um, which 
is intended to assist wildlife professionals exploring the role of cl that climate change might play in the health and disease of wildlife species. Um, the tool won't provide a definitive answer to the question of is wildlife health issue a cons of concern likely to be affected by climate change, but it'll provide direction on how you go about answering that in a systematic way. And we engage Cheryl Stank Sangster, who is another co-author from the Climate Change and Animal Health book, who co-authored the chapter on the study and classification of climate associated diseases in, in animals. And she used this model to come up with um, a tool that uses uh, this, these seven exposure pathways to help guide investigation into the impacts of climate change on wildlife health disease. So the way that the tool is supposed to be used is in a stepwise version where we first help the user define the health issue of concern, then define the scale of focus. And remember, we always talked about how it's important to act locally and define your scale. And then finally, we use the we evaluate the, the problem as it's been defined in the context of those seven climate associated exposure pathways. So we're working on automating, automating the tool a little to make it easier to use and to generate outputs in a, a clear and simple format. We're also thinking about how we can embed the use of this tool in our own practices, for example, by including an evaluation of climate change impacts in our fact sheets on specific diseases, or perhaps determining climate change impacts for the major diseases in our surveillance database. But once we played around with it a bit, we plan to make it available on our web, website for others to use as they wish and how they think it will be valued. Uh, we're also trying to frame climate change for a wildlife health audience through our fact sheets, and we've created a specific fact sheet on climate change, which is available on our website and is based on highlighting some of the important mechanisms from the climate change and animal health text for Australian wildlife. Um, and finally, the WHA Emergencies Program is, is working hard to... Um, to centralise climate change as a driver for environmental emergencies in, in the way we position our programs. Um, the program's less than two years old and it's taken a while for us to figure out how best in, to engage with the very complex space of emergencies and wildlife. But we're now waking, making some inroads and clearly many emergencies involving wildlife, particularly natural disasters, are going to be impacted by climate change. And the inquiries that we touched on, uh, we touch on here, have um, recognised that the wildlife sphere does lack strategic organisation and frameworks in relation to emergencies, and this is probably a gap that Wildlife Health Australia could step into and assist with trying to facilitate um, a, a more national nationalised approach to how wildlife are managed in emergencies. So we're developing some principles around that idea and we want to continue to leverage our networks and the trust we've developed to bring wildlife into the conversation about emergencies at a national level. So I, I, I guess a few take-home messages. Um, we, we all have the capacity to learn from others and we all have different starting points. So uh, you don't have to lock themselves in, yourself to a gate or sleep in a tree to participate in protecting the planet. And really that's what brings me here today to talk about climate change to people who already probably know a lot about climate change um, is to start building those bridges um, between wildlife and, and, and other contexts of uh, veterinary medicine in Australia. And I'll leave the last word with Brenda, the civil disobedience penguin. So despair is unhelpful. Let's not despair. Let's keep hoping. Um, and remember that for hope to be compelling, it has to be more than naive optimism. It does require action, even in the face of long odds. So we can all do our little bit with our one little flipper. We can all take action. So thank you very much for listening today. And I acknowledge the many people who've uh, been a big part of my climate um, change journey and also my uh, support of an inspirational WHA colleagues and networks. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Simone. It was so insightful. I'm sure everyone feels the same. We're going to open it up now for any questions that anyone might have. Um, please feel free to either pop them in the chat and I can read them out. Otherwise, please take yourself off mute and ask away.
No questions. That's good. Oh, yeah. It's very, very. <laughs> I must have been comprehensive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of thank yous yeah. in the chat. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. I, w- I will ask a question, Simone. <laughs> good on you, Maria. <laughs> um, I First, I want to say thank you. I really love the um, disease risk analysis for koalas. Um, it's been invaluable. Just to context, I'm um, the Northern Rivers Koala Emergency Response Coordinator for, and um, I'm a koala rescuer and you know, the causal flow chart for disease in koalas is really interesting. Um, I'm really concerned, particularly this season, uh, summer, about the um, effect of loss of habitat quality and quantity as a result of climate change-related events. So prolonged heat and, and drought and these things are really appearing to be exacerbating the disease level. And, you know, it would be great to collaborate on something that gives us more data and evidence to, like, we're just lacking that, you know, being able to say that koalas exposed to the, or, or other wildlife as well that are exposed to these conditions are predisposed for being at risk of increased disease well that that was actually one of the things that <clears throat> was uh, for me it was a watershed moment in the koala dra is um you you had around the table the foremost minds in koala disease and when people think disease with koalas they think chlamydia they think corv they think heat stress that you whatever <laughs> um but without exception all of those people said, we, we need to talk about disease completely in the context of habitat. And they all went straight to habitat. But we were able, when we created that spider, to go, okay, what we're saying here is that um, habitat continuity, quantity and quality impact everything about a koala's life, absolutely everything. And so what we were able to do with the DRA is to say, all right, the 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 one thing that you can do, forget about medicines, forget about vaccination, forget about all these things. The one best thing you can do to improve koalas' health and their resilience to disease and and address disease as a risk is deal with habitat quality, quantity and connectivity. And making that the, 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 um, the first cab off the rank was, was and continues to be a really important um, aspect of how the koala recovery team is going forward with its with its actions, and um, it's been a, a really important reference for the health and welfare section of the koala recovery team actions to actually make those connections, and <laughs> that's been hugely valuable. And that and that's really great. And I agree, but we are now in an emergency response situation where we have more diseased animals than we have capacity to deal with. And it needs to be twofold. Habitat restoration and protection has like a bit of a lag effect there. And, you know, we need to be dealing with, with things now. Yeah, and this is this is always the the duality with wildlife is when you're in the middle of a crisis, how do you address the crisis as well as addressing the strategy? And and I think what often happens is that um, when when we pay attention to the crisis, we can sometimes lose sight of what strategies we need to put in place to stop mm. that happening again, and. Um, I think trying that's that's when I talk about um, WHA walk, walking into the strategic plus space. I think that that's something that, in time, we can help to um, improve that narrative so that we um, don't get the situation where all the funding and all the response goes into reactive. Um, 
reactive uh, solutions and then we look around and we haven't future-proofed ourselves against future emergencies. Mm. It's a really complex space. But, um, yeah, I think that... Um, I think that the koala plight and particularly post bushfires, but also in terms of heat stress, a, a whole bunch of other uh, other risks that they're facing that aren't infectious, like um, trauma, motor vehicle accidents, bushfires and so on, um, uh, are all things that need to be addressed with, with that duality in mind, you know, the strategy as well as the emergency response. And I think if we can get better engagement, um, we can work on, as Wildlife Health Australia, we can work on our engagement with advocacy groups and rehabilitation sector. We might be able to start building on that at the at the national level. Thank you. Thanks, Simone. Thanks, Marie. That was a great question. Uh, Michelle has a question in the chat. She also said, fabulous presentation, Simone. I think we can all agree. Many of the examples you highlighted, uh, many, sorry, many examples highlight how complex natural systems are. Yes, they're awful, question. aren't they, Michelle? Yeah. <laughs> and she, follow, she follows on with, what is your advice on communicating these complexities to general audiences that vets and other animal professionals interact with? I, I think... Um, as you know, Michelle, I love a diagram and I think that we could get better at producing graphics that help us to explain these things. That's another area that I found the Climate Change and Animal Health book really great for is, is um, capturing some of those graphics that, that help us to explain those complexities. Um, I, I still use the, the koala DRA spider uh, as a general example of, see, it's all connected. <laughs> and I use that across all sorts of diseases and in all sorts of wildlife. So I feel like there are ways that we can continue to sort of build those sorts of resources. And that's something um, that as Wildlife Health Australia in the emergencies program, we've got our eye on. We're, we're very close now to developing these, uh, what we call our key principles of wildlife management in emergencies. And there's a graphic that goes with that. And um, we're hoping that we can um, use that uh, or, or others can use that to leverage that sort of conversation as well. Um, I think that, um, you know, there are, there are many other, other agencies that have done some awesome, awesome graphics on those sorts of things. And I think the more we can share those things and the more we can... Um, circulate then there's probably hundreds that I'm not aware of that um, could be really valuable for us in, in making those connections but a, a lot of it is um, again um, about finding finding that common language and and that can be that's a real challenge sometimes with the general public um, that might not have the same um, awareness of the complexities that we do Again, I think that there is a place for some really, um, there's there's needs for some really fundamental guiding principles that we can all hang off. And that's what we'll be concentrating on as in the Emergencies Program of Wildlife Health Australia is trying to provide some of those fundamental things that other people can take and adapt for, for their own audiences. So watch this space. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Simone. Uh, were there any other questions? That anyone had got a, about two more minutes. Simone, was there anything else that you wanted to finish with? Um, look, no, I don't think so. I, I guess, um, like I say, there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing that I've talked about today with wildlife is is really that different. Um, in terms of what uh, you might be experiencing in, in your own veterinary um, worlds um, in terms of climate change. Um, I think that, that, like I say, because wildlife are so um, intimately associated with the natural environment, it makes it easier to see some of these parallels, but they're absolutely there for domestic animals as well. So it may be that some of the examples that I've used today might be helpful to you in exploring um within the domestic animal sphere as well um and really happy to have those conversations with people if they're if they've got particular 
questions that they'd like to um, put to to us as Wildlife Health Australia and and talk a, a lot more about about that that those aspects. Yeah, be very happy to do that. Amazing. Thank you so much once again, Simone. I think that wraps up our February 1st Masterclass of the Year. Um, on behalf of everyone that attended and those that didn't, I just want to say thank you so much for all that incredible information that you've shared tonight. Um, I've also popped the link to that book in the chat just for those that didn't catch that before. Um, uh, as I mentioned at the start, I will be uploading this recording to our YouTube channel and our website tomorrow. Um, so if you'd like to watch it again, and for those that obviously weren't able to join us tonight, they can watch it in their own time. So thank you so much once again to Simone. You've been amazing. And thank you everyone for attending this presentation tonight. Please keep an eye out for our next masterclass, which is happening in March. But on behalf of everyone, thank you so much, Simone. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their Thursday evening. Thanks, everyone.